Good afternoon, United Seminary, here and abroad, and online, and recorded, and all that good stuff. Um, remind folks that this video ministry is important to the life of the, of the seminary, and it's always good to kind of like and subscribe when you look at this YouTube video, and know that that helps us as a seminary get our word out there, and it helps you because you get a notice when other videos get dropped. Um, and so we're thrilled to make this happen. Um, chapel this summer will be a little bit uh, kind of ad hoc and as, as it happens, um, uh, which will be all good. It'll be spirit led, as they say, um, in the world. Uh, and focus mostly on, on some faculty sermons, um, but we can do other things as well. And so if you have an idea, please let us know. Time does not matter. We can do it at any time, at any place, um, and uh, make that happen. So. Um, Thrilled to have you here. Uh, again, I'm T. Michael Rock. I'm the shepherd of the chapel, and so I get a chance to kind of make this happen sometimes. And today, one of my th great joys would have been to introduce Dr. Jennifer Oz Freeman, um, who is one of our gifted faculty members here uh, that teaches historical theology um, and criticism and theology in the arts, and among many other things. And uh, one of the unique pieces that uh, Jennifer brings to this work is uh, a deep commitment to the Orthodox Church. Um, and so I had a chance to attend the unnailing of the cross, uh, unnailing of Jesus at her Orthodox uh, community um, on Orthodox Good Friday. And it was powerful to listen to the music, to witness um, the movements of the clergy and of the people, and uh, to smell the incense and to gaze upon the icons and uh, develop a, kind of an intimate relationship with the, the visual and sensory images of the Orthodox faith. And, um, and Dr. Ross Freeman would have been here today to talk more about that, um, but we will reschedule her. So, because that's what we do. Um, and so prayer on, um, uh, on Dr. Oz Freeman as she heals and gets ready for our summer term, which begins today. And so we're excited to start that off in the midst of um, this new world. I want to start today. Um, so yeah, so you're going to get me today. So you're going to get probably too much of T. Michael. Um, but just so it's not all T. Michael, I need to bring a dear friend, a North Sider, um, poet, uh, prophet, into this mix. Joe Davis is a, a powerful force in, in our world, and I, I think he's been here at the seminary um, at some point. If not, we need to bring him here. But Joe Davis gives us this poem prayer called Life. I believe whether we know it or not, we are always talking with God. I believe whether we know it or not, we are always talking with God. Laughing, weeping, raging, ranting, eating, sleeping, daydreaming, dancing. Everything above, everything below, or in between. Whispers and screams, mutters and moans, grunts and groans. More than wagging tongues, ebbing lungs and tickled throats. Our body's language sings letters and notes, books printed on skin and bone, sent back home, delivered through space and time. And each moment there is one who listens intently and bends gently and responds in kind. Amen. Thank you, Joe Davis. So the vision for these chapels is to bring a prophetic word, to kind of make uh, a word that actually um, counters some of the empirical Christianity that, that masks for Christianity out in the world. And, um, and I think many of our graduates who have just graduated and other students and our faculty and staff, they do this every day. They, they present a Christianity and a progressive faith of many faiths that flies in the face of the empire um, that continues to control um, and dehumanize and diminish and destroy. And so our nonviolent way of love um, is, uh, 
steeped in our sacred text, but it's also steeped in the lives of the people that live out their faith. And so that's the prophetic word that comes today as we um, are closing in the Christian tradition in Easter season. Uh, we have to remind ourselves that we are Easter people, and we are people of resurrection and hope, and, uh, and we will not let uh, dehumanizing uh, faith that masks itself in the name of our faith uh, to win. And so we will continue to do this struggle in a real way. And so I'm focused today um, because, I, I mean, I think Jesus did this too. Jesus was taking his own faith, his Jewish faith, and flying in the face of an empire uh, um, that co-opted the Jewish leaders at the time. And um, always continuing to reform and rebuild uh, a deep sense of understanding of what it means to be in relationship with the sacred, with God. And so in this long three-chapter event in the Gospel of John before the trial um, and the doubting and the resurrection, um, Jesus comes to the disciples um, and talks about uh, who they are and who they're called to be so that they have uh, something to hold on to um, after he is gone. From John chapter 17, and I thought about singing this like in the orthodox way, like chanting the scripture, but I'm not good at that, so... I could do like the first line and then I would fall apart. Um, I have made your name known to those, who, to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. They know this. For the words that you gave me, I have given to them. And they have received them and know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you have sent me. So I'm asking on their behalf, on these beloved friends, these disciples, on their behalf. See, I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, these beloveds. That's kind of how we think of our students and our, our mission here at the seminary, our beloveds. I say this on behalf of those you gave us, because they are yours. In fact, all mine are yours, and yours are mine. And the good news is that I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And so I'm coming to you, creator, parent, loving one, the source of all that is. Please protect them in your name. Please protect them in what you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. Now while I was with them, I tried to protect them in your name that you had given me. I guarded them and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost. You know, Judas, shh, you know. Just one was lost. And I still lament that dear one who was lost. But the rest of them were not lost so that the scripture might be fulfilled. And so I'm coming to you and I speak these things in the world so that you may have my joy made complete in them. See, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. So I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from all that will divide and diminish and destroy them. Protect them from evil. They do, not, they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. And so please sanctify them. Make them holy. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so you have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself so that they might be sanctified, be made holy in the truth. Amen.
It's interesting. There's like two prayers in Scripture that Jesus speaks, and one of them people know by heart, the words of the Lord's Prayer. But this prayer is so good. <laughs> and we don't know it by heart, but it's a powerful prayer. And it's a longer prayer. <laughs> it's a, but it's a powerful prayer. And it really focuses on, on a couple different themes that I'll talk about. But, I, but first I wanted to um, remind us that there are other forces out there in the world. And kind of some of them are kind of encapsulated in some of the great art and care of the world, um, including in Shakespeare. And so for those of you who love Shakespeare, this is from Act 5, Scene 5, you know it well, from Macbeth. The character Macbeth has heard that the queen is dead and he knows that his own death is imminent. They're coming for him. And he delivers these famous lines. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets this hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. What a depressing <laughs> soliloquy, <laughs> and yet a famous one, because in the midst of grief, Sometimes meaning has been lost. Is Macbeth right in his grief? Is life nothing more than a shadow, having no substance, no meaning? And it's the core of the philosopher's great question, right? What is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of death? Someone once said that trying to speak about ultimate reality is like sending a kiss through a messenger. I understand the point, but something is lost in the translation. What is the meaning of life? A philosophical question to be sure, but this is not just the philosopher's question. It is a genuinely human question that is asked out of despair, it is asked out of hope, it's sometimes asked out of cynicism, what well, a sincere curiosity and a deep desire to have some meaning, guidance, care, love in the midst of grief. However we raise this question about the meaning of life, it is a most fundamental basic question and it comes as no surprise that this is the question that Jesus deals with in this prayer in the midst of grief. But the unique thing about this passage is that Jesus is not doing this in front of the Pharisees or in the temple or uh, in a public place. He doesn't instruct people to pray in this way. It's so genuine and so loving and so caring. And it doesn't deal with questions. It deals with the sincere hope that we care for each other. And we learn to love each other, even in the midst of grief, and that death may actually have meaning. In the context, many scholars call this prayer Jesus' high priestly prayer because it is one of the few prayers. But it's also a priestly moment. And it's one of the things we train seminarians in is to have this role of priest, even though we don't call them that in all the traditions. But the idea to pray for and care for the people that you're called to serve is a deep abiding role that chaplains and pastors and spiritual leaders do in their work. And so we want to listen to this prayer. And so I'll lift up a few key verses. Jesus says, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe. I tried really hard but I will remain in this world no longer. And so please, Holy One, protect them by the power of your name and the name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. Sanctify them in truth, for your word is truth. And that's kind of what we do here at United Seminary is to pass along what they say in, I think it's TR 10 something, 
truth, goodness, and beauty, right? It's, it's, it's the core piece of what we try to pass along. And to understand that truth is found in not just sacred text, but in the natural world. And truth is found in relationships. And truth is found um, in the traditions, the religious traditions people come in with. And truth is most importantly found in the stories of the people in those classes. It's the intersection of these truths that we're at and that provides the greatest knowledge for the meaning of life and creates the greatest spiritual leaders. We're answering the call that Jesus puts out in this passage. What I want us to do is to remember that finding the meaning of this moment when we're filled with grief and there's loss and there's the hope is hard to find and we're so tempted to go the way of Macbeth. We're so tempted to lament and despair and not see the bigger picture. That the stepping stones, the things that get us over this rushing wave of grief are these moments of truth. And of love. And so the, the intersection here that is so important is this intersection of all of the different ways we understand truth. And truth does set us free. It liberates. It's full of hope and care. And it's really the only thing we're called to do is to listen for and lift up these moments of truth real abiding truth, not just for me, but the intersection of yours and mine in the midst of this finding what truth means. And in that promise, in that prayer, that is where we become one. That is the core of our relationship, is finding a truth in another. And if you've ever been in love, you know that when your truth meets somebody else's truth, that is just a gift. A gift of loving, understanding, of friendship, of care, of, of, and commitment, and, and finding the way to respect and understand and honor each other's truth is what we do long for. And I think it's a core piece of what we do as we teach here in the seminary to find your truth, to do your own work, right? To, to find who you are, to be really clear and, and, and fully alive in yourself, in your skin, in your bones, and hold that truth for others as well. And that intersection of those truths is such a powerful way and is where we find that spirit wonderful presence of the divine. And so, I want to remind folks that this is not just a sermon, but it's full of meaning and purpose. And, and it proclaims that Macbeth is wrong. That don't be so quick to live in that despair. But all of life has meaning, and death has meaning, and the natural world shines its meaning on us all the time. And sacred text has meaning. And when we find where our meanings intersect with each other, that's where the truth lies. And so I can't do a prophetic word, a sermon, without a little practical experience about how this happened for me. And, and what's happened as I started this role at the seminary is when I was in seminary, which nobody really wants to know. <laughs> But, but it's, it happens in me. It's in my bones. When I hear different professors say things or administrators say certain things, I go, oh, yeah, I remember when so-and-so said that. And because um, uh, I was so raw and new and not knowing really what I was doing as a spiritual leader, but I was thrust into different ways to do ministry, as all of our students are, and often the faculty and administrators are as well, as we're thrust into these moments of sacred, sacred um, care for ourselves and others and when our truths meet to lift up that experience of the divine and so um, in my bones um, and I was just I, I heard Dr. Chapman Leap uh, speak beautifully about interreligious chaplaincy um, and, and and what it means to be present for another and to kind of find a way to put your story aside for just a moment and really be present to that truth of the, of the one in front of you. And um, one of the very first visits I ever did, I was still in seminary, but I was serving a local church in, in Massachusetts, and um, I was asked to go see Marion Letney. And Marion, I didn't really 
wanted to see her. She was kind of, she was dying. She was at the last stages of hospice care in a home. Um, her family had been there. We had done a little thing, and 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 then they had left. And so and she was still hanging on. And they said, "You you probably need to go see her again." And so I did. And she was in that place where her mouth was open and she was breathing periodically in, in the moments before death. And, and I walked in and did what all chaplains do or pastors in the moment, you know, you introduce yourself. <laughs> Not that she cared <laughs> who I was or what I was doing. Um, but uh, one word came out of her open mouth um, as she kind of formed. And, and the simple word was sing. So I breathed, and I closed my eyes, and I said, Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I'm tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand. Precious Lord, lead me home. And when I opened my eyes, Marion wasn't breathing anymore. And, and in that moment, her truth and mine had meaning. And purpose and somehow this ministry we're called to makes a difference when no one's watching when no one's looking out at us when there's no papers to be read or graded <laughs> but we're in genuine relationship with another and we're protecting each other and sanctifying each other that your life is holy and beloved and so is mine <laughs> And we are loved, lovable, and loving, and we're protected in that moment. That's when ministry happens. If it happened then, it happens all the time in our students' lives. And I hope you find those intersections where you are feeling in yourself the prayer, the vision that Jesus has for you to be protected and to be sanctified, and that you're passing along those prayers for others. And friends, this is and always has been the good news. Amen. So thank you for coming to United Chapel here and online. You are holy and protected and sanctified by the prayers of this community and of each other. So thank you.